Um, today, we're pleased to have Chris Mickle from CDM demonstrate how to use the latest format for creating and submitting EDDs to NYSD. And I'd like to introduce Chris Mickle. Okay, thank you very much, Elaine. Um, I'm very happy to be here to help New York State DC um, with working through uh, using the, the EDD format and the best ways to create EDD submissions. Uh, we've posted here on this um, slide some different links to websites uh, that you all have as references, and we advise you to go take a look at these. The New York State DEC webpage, they have posted a quick start guide, as well as you can download the format files from this EarthSoft website. They um, will be posting there soon a, a manual that you can also uh, get that has comprehensive information on how to use the EDD format. And so right now what I'd like to do is, is go ahead and, and get into uh, EDP, which is the, elect the, uh, the Equus Data Processor. It's a standalone data checker that is used to go ahead and uh, check the data uh, in your submittal. And what we'll do today is we'll demonstrate how to create an EDD and the various error messages that you would get when you, when you log in and actually go through this process and what are some of the best methods for um, repairing them. So the first thing to really look at within the format is the, um, the way the files are grouped. I'll actually go back to this, this presentation. I have a, a slide on this. Um, this, this electronic data processor, this is the latest version. It's 5.5.1. That's compatible with the Equus 5.5.1. When you go through and download the webinar, uh, excuse me, when you download the format files, you'll, be, you'll need to open EDP and register and put your information into the screen, which will then send you a registration string to um, work with EDP. And as I mentioned, um, the format has these multiple groupings for field, vapor intrusion, laboratory and basic chemistry, uh, which is basically the historical um, data that you can submit to the DEC. And it also has EDD sections. Uh, here you can see in the, under what they call the field, uh, this is all information about the site on, in the EDD, which uh, is related to the data provider, you know, who's submitting the data, uh, the sub-facilities, which are required um, for a site. You have to have uh, at least one uh, sub-facility and operable unit or such, and then the locations that you have at, at a site. So the location. Um, other things that are captured in the field are geophysical data that includes lithology and geology data, um, as well as anything related to the wells and how the wells were constructed, um, drilling activity during the construction of the wells, uh, as well as downhole point data during that drilling event, uh, extraction data, that gets collected during uh, well development, and um, other field samples uh, that get put into field results, soil gas data, and water level information. So you find that all in the field data, and essentially the data provider sub-facility and location submittal could be you know, your, what you'd call the initial submittal, where you submit that to DEC one time uh, once your facility has been created, and um, then you would then submit the additional um, geophysical data. They do have a comprehensive uh, vapor intrusion section um, that relates to the buildings where vapor intrusion sampling is, takes place. And then they have a laboratory section, which is the analytical chemistry data that gets collected uh, and, and samples that get analyzed by labs and provided on EDDs. Uh, data providers need, need to go through that and submit that as part of this package. And they can any samples that get submitted must already have a location, uh, a unique location identifier in the database. And so um, then, like, as I mentioned, this basic section is for historical data. Um, and we ask that, you know, anybody who, um, you know, anybody wants to use the historical data submission should consult with their New York State DEC project manager uh, prior to doing that. And with respect to the sub-facility, um, they also want to talk with their New York State DEC project manager regarding sub-facilities that, that would be set up. So now we'll go into EDP and look at these tables. Um, so within, within EDP, um, when you download the format files, uh, they typically uh, go onto your hard drive um, in, a, in a folder. I'll just show you here within in the C drive where the program files, uh, EarthSoft Equus is contained. 
Um, you have formats, and here we have the New York State DEC formats, which are comprised of these files. Uh, the reference value file, which is updated regularly, um, you need to go to the website to download that to update, and basically um, some Visual Basic and XML code. Um, but when you're in EDP and you, you click on format and, and open up that format file, as you can see, I'm in that directory, Equus Formats New York State DEC. And when you open the format, it will put this tree that we just looked at in your window so you can see all the various sections. Now the next thing I did was I, I opened up an EDD by clicking on EDD and choosing this EDD as a webinar sample EDD to open that. And I already have that preloaded in here. But what's really important to um, point out, what we have here is a, is a button to, to download a blank EDD template. And you'll notice if you uh, mouse over that button, you can hold the shift key down and click a blank EDD and it'll actually export all the reference values into that blank EDD, so you'll have it. But I'm going to um, go back to this here and open up the blank EDD. So when you open up the EDD template, you have some information about the EDD, what latest version, um, and some, some things to note on this EDD is how the column headers are set. Um, you have those column headers that are part of the primary key in the database. Those are underlined and in red. You also have column headers that are just red. Those are required fields. You want to make sure to fill those in. And lookup values are, are tables uh, that are uh, fields that are related to other tables in the database. Um, so all across, you'll see these are required fields that must be populated within the format. So you can start here with a blank EDD uh, right from the database, and you can start to populate it. Um, as I mentioned, having some of the reference tables in here will allow you to only be able to select certain values that are in the EDD format um, because you've downloaded the blank EDD template with the format, uh, excuse me, with the reference value. So that's a good good feature that they have. This other button right here actually will, will bring up a blank EDD description file which will actually walk you through every field in the EDD and the description that's posted um, as New York State described um, them. So this has all been updated for you and is available to you as a reference and it mirrors what is in the uh, manual that they have produced as well. So when we get into EDP, um, we're not sure you know, if we've created the EDD in Excel. Um, we, we may have sections that are flagged here in red that indicate there is an error. Um, or we may have um, you know, um, those sections that don't have errors are in green. Uh, it is good to understand what these errors are. If you go to your EDP globe up here and go to options, you can look in the appearance. Again, you can see the column headers and what they mean. You can also look at the various um, highlights that will happen and get a pretty brief description of what the highlight means, uh, whether or not it's a duplicate row error or if it's a uh, orphan row error or um, you know a reference value that's not in the system. So what we'll do right now is we'll take a look at some different um, some different sections within the within the, uh, the EDD and look at some of these errors. Now right here you can see that I have many rows and if I put my mouse over this I have an orphan uh, row. Now the, the reason why I, I know why why I have these errors here is because I don't have a sample associated with them. So I am going to select these. There's quite a few, and I'm going to, and I'm going to remove them from this EDD uh, because I don't want them in here. So I can select the first row, hold the shift key down, and select the last one, and then delete these rows. This is good to. Um, this is part of the, the creation of this EDD package that I created here. Um, there's quite a bit of data in here. I have some more orphan rows. I do want to delete these uh, because I know that they are. Um, not part of this data set. So I, I can select them, I can click and drag, and I can get them all out of here. So, um, and then I have some other errors, um, but I know, for instance, this error right here um, related to CDM as a company code, it's saying that it's an orphan row, and that's because CDM is not listed up here as a data provider. I have camp dresser and McKee. So that's an issue right there. And this error message is actually saying that the value exceeds the field length. So if I can change this to um, CDM, 
I can fix the error related to the field length. This field now is green. It has um, the, the row that's in here contains information about CDM and all the required fields are populated. Um, and now when I come down to this uh, error message, I still have the orphan record here, but I can come up to this refresh button and refresh this table. And now that error is, has been cleared. Uh, if I turn my errors only on, I can see that I have I still have more errors related to um, you know data that looks to be um, if I leave it to sample must have a related test result. So again, I think these are some EDDs that um, or some samples in this particular um, EDD that I, I don't want in here because I don't have the test results. I haven't removed these yet. So I'm just selecting those and removing them. If I turn off my errors only, I still have about um, I have two two rows really that have errors uh, in my sample section. But um, let's take a look at the total amount of, of rows. And this is um, just taking a moment while it refreshes this table. And we'll take a look at that. Um, with respect to the data provider tab, and I, we, we do have, um, you can submit that initially with the locations in the sub-facility and get that into, into the system. As you can see here in this sub-facility, I have um, three operable units. These sub-facility codes, uh, we, we re recommend that you work with your New York State DEC project manager to confirm how these sub-facilities are going to be named. Um, and other information about the sub-facility is the name of it. Um, you know, maybe a description, uh, the, the contact person who's responsible for the sub-facility, and, and an address information, uh, as well as an email address. So that, that information. Now, the sub-facility code will get loaded onto location. And again, we have the same orphan row error, but I know I fixed that in data provider, so I'm going to refresh this table as well to fix that error. And let's look at some of these other errors that, that we have on the location section right now. One of them is this lat long. It's not correct. There's the values not found in the list. I can click the list to look at the list, and I can see that lat space long is the correct value. Here I'm going to demonstrate a way to find and replace this error. I can highlight the column. I can hit Control F. I can come up here and type lat long, and I can replace it with lat space long, and then hit replace all, and then that is going to go through this table, replacing that field fixing that error. When I click off that, that error has been resolved. Some other errors I know I have in here is that I did not complete the horizontal accuracy value. I'm going to do the same thing. Unlike Excel, you can actually find a blank, and you can replace that with a value. So I'm going to put plus or minus uh, one point in this uh, accuracy value. I'm going to replace that all in this column. That's what I have selected, and I just replace that in that error. Over here, we have an elevated um, elevation datum code. Um, and just so I, I can be a little bit more descriptive, but basically, in the location table, we have everything re related to the sample location and the lat long coordinates and decimal degrees, as well as an alternate coordinate. In this case, it happens to be UTM zone 17, um, with information that talks about how the hor horizontal data and, and um, elevation data was collected. This information is going to be in the manual as well as it's um, in line and sync with what is in the EPA Region 2 guidance, the same code, et cetera. Um, one thing I, I know is this error over here, um, horizontal accuracy unit, when you look up the unit 5, um, I believe that is for the feet, and 5 here for the elevation unit is also the feet. This one code is, um, this is actually NAV uh, 88, so instead of 1, it needs to be 001. So I can highlight this and, and change that relatively uh, quickly using the find and replace. Um, change that to make that right. You do have the, the ability to select things here as well as you know copy and move down a cell and control V paste. That works copying and pasting right in the grid. You can do that as well. Um, and now I'm going to close this find replace. I still have some errors here don't see them, I'll turn my errors only, and hopefully now I've got 12 errors where I have a subcontractor name that is actually listed as unknown because I don't know what it is. That, unfortunately, is not in the reference table list, so 
but I do know that this is not a required field, so I can leave that blank. Here's a situation where I'm just going to backspace over those to resolve that error, and now I'm green there. Um, with respect to drilling activity, I do have a lot of data on the drilling activity tab. Um, right now, I'm only showing the error row, which is related, again, to an orphan record that I need to delete. Uh, I could also go to my location and actually find the corresponding location code and change it to that. But I know that this location is not actually part of this data set, but I will remove it. I just checked off the uh, errors only, just so I can look at all the data. And it's not, uh, it's, it's going to think about that for a minute. I want you to get a picture of what goes on to this tab. But while we wait for this, I just would mention that location codes must be unique. Um, they're required, and they must be unique within a facility. So you can only have one MW1 in a facility. Coordinates are required uh, for each location as well. Unless it's a quality control sample, um, then you would not um, have a location for quality control data. Um, trip blanks do not have locations. Equipment blanks and rinsing blanks should have a parent sample code associated with a, a, an actual sampling location, but they would not have a, a sample location themselves. Um, location and sample IDs should always be different and unique within a site uh, facility. So those are some key points about locations. It's really critical. And then so here's the drilling activity. And you can see each of my locations, what the event type was, uh, the start depth and the end depth of that event, the time, and then the drilling method. There are other fields to, to capture the fluid viscosity, hammer weight, et cetera. I'm not using those right now, but I am indicating that this is a new um, activity. It's not a repair of an existing well or a deepen or an abandoned. Other information about the activity in and of itself. Um, so this one error, I'm going to remove this by um, deleting that often record in that screen. Uh, with respect to lithology, I don't have lithology data for that HTW40 either, so I'm going to delete those records um, as well. And now that's green. And I would just indicate, you know, I showed you when a field exceeds a value, it has a certain highlight of um, yellow. When I, I showed you see can't press the key exceeded the field line. Uh, some other errors that you know could be possible are um, having a value like not on a pick list. So if we had like X for instance. And if I refresh this table, you know, you'll see that that's going to be, uh, well, actually, material type in this case is not um, referencing the, um, the RT material lookup table on lithology, uh, not as it does on, on other tables. This could be, this actually could be with respect to uh, a new EDD format that is being posted this afternoon that we'll be working with later. So uh, when you load locations, it does create wells um, for those locations that are of a monitoring well type. Um, so I have the wells listed, um, well purpose, top of casing elevation, uh, the, the datum value that's been set for this, which is actually the top of casing elevation, the unit. Uh, the description of the datum is basically saying that uh, measuring this from the top of the casing of the well. Uh, step of linear de designations based on um, how we're measuring these as we go down the well. Um, and then the datum start date for when we actually initialize as well. The depth unit is in feet. There is other information related to the construction and the sump pumps and things that may be installed in a well. Um, not using those. I do have a casing joint type of threaded, and um, that's that. But let's see. I do have an error in here. I don't see it right away. I will turn on errors only. Here are my errors. We'll look over at some of these errors here real quick. What I have here is I have a, co a contractor who's not on the list of contractors in the reference table. Uh, just another note about reference values, if you do want to look at the reference values, you can do that right here in EDP. When you click on the reference value tab, you go to RT company and look at all the RT uh, companies that, uh, uh, that are in the approved list. Um, and we can what we can do for the purposes of this, I'm going to change this to uh, a different contractor, a, a correct one. If, if your contractor is not on this list, you can, uh, we'll talk about this in a minute, but basically ask that it be added to the reference values. So in this case, I'm going to change some of these. Um, and actually, I'm going to set it to CDM for now. Uh, it's just taking HWS to make that CDM. 
and lane. I'm going to make that CD. I'm using find and replace to um, fix these. And I still have some errors. I have some more orphan records that I'm going to delete. And now I have that green. With my well construction, I have a couple of orphan records that I'm also going to delete. Before I do that, I'll just give you an idea of what's in this table. Um, you do have the, the segment type. Of what is the depth of your casing? What is the, uh, the depth of your screen? This is really important to uh, doing uh, geophysical and groundwater modeling. Um, the units that this is captured in, uh, information about the diameter, the inner and outer diameter of the well, uh, the slot size of the screen, all this information that can be used in reports um, with, with Gantt or other tools. So I'm going to delete those two and get that set to green. My water level table didn't have any errors. I'm going to uncheck the error only button just to take a look at that. Um, and we'll, we'll see what, what some of the data is in that. Now, one thing I, I, I am noticing here is that the vapor intrusion section is causing an error. And what I find interesting about that is I did not load any, any data on those tables. And the recommendation is, is that if you're not using one of the tables in the EDD, don't have it in the EDD when you open up EDP. A couple of reasons for that. Um, benefits of not having those tables in the EDD is that it won't, it'll load quicker because it doesn't have to go through that table. And it will also um, you know, avoid any orphan records. For instance, if you're loading just sample um, location test results, and, uh, excuse me, test results QC in, in the batch section, um, you do not need to have um, the location section present if those locations are already in the database. But if the location table is present, it's going to look for a parent sample code, excuse me, a parent location code on the location table and cause a little bit of problems. In this case, I'm just going to right click on the section and say clear table. It's going to clear that table. It's still giving me an error, but as I move off that, that error has gone away. So with respect to the water levels, for every well I have, I have measurement dates and what the historical reference elevation is and the water level depth as well as the water level elevation and then the units for those water levels. And this place for other information um, regarding uh, LNAPL and DNAPL, et cetera, if you have product in your well. Um, in this case, we don't, so I did not populate those. But I have populated all the key fields, again, which are red and underlined and required fields that are red. And um, this is a lookup field means I can only choose the values in this uh, section. So that gets me down to this analytical chemistry section here where let's see how many errors we have here. Now I only have four errors on the samples because I have already deleted many uh, orphan records. Here is a, a, a couple of samples that do not have a location. I could actually go into location and, and add the location um, to, to fix that error. Um, but in this case, I'm actually going to delete those because I know I'm not loading the, those locations in this data set. So I am removing those right now. And that section is now um, clean. So information about the samples um, that we have in here, you know, you have to have a data provider who's providing the sample information if it's already in the database or if it's in the data provider section. The sample code, which is critical that the sample code is a unique identifier. Um, I believe that, that New York State DC prefers to have like maybe a date appended to it, a sample ID to make it unique. There are other ways to make it unique. Consult your project manager and, and those that are working on your project as the best methods when you're planning these projects out and you can't go wrong. Um, sample name, sample matrix code, um, these are all pins to look up tables in the database, so you must use these tables. So if I wanted to use you know, GW here, uh, it's going to tell me, no, you can't use GW. That's not found in the reference value table. That's a typical error. And I can just type that back and switch it back to WG. Um, it wants to know what type of sample is it. Is it a normal sample? Uh, one thing it's good to point out right here is that you do have this ability to do a filter. You turn your filters on. You can filter the different types. So in this EDD, I have soil and groundwater. Uh, I can also note in my sample types that I have field dupes, normal samples, trip blanks. Um, I can also note that I have samples that are, are coming from the field and lab. And those lab samples, um, you know, in this case, are uh, normal samples, which is uh, interesting in this case because typically you would have like a lab QC, so I definitely need to look at that. Um, I probably have the sample source set incorrectly on this. 
So therefore, what I'll do is I'm just going to change that to field and copy and paste that to field for this data set because I know that normal environmental samples don't get generated in the lab, they get generated in the field. So that's how you can fix some data right within the EDD grid. Um, I have a sample date, a location code that's, that's uh, important to link these two locations in the database, sample depths and end depths and feet, um, the sample company code. In this case, I have NA, which is, uh, appears to be an approved value, uh, but there are also, you can put your company code that's from the data provider table. Uh, is the sample composited? Yes, no. Um, and there are other fields of, of you can populate. Uh, what's a really good field, just to note, is this task code. And any time you mouse over a column header, you get a little tool tip on what is in that column. And this is, this is the code to identify tasks, uh, tasks in which a field sample is retrieved. So here you might work with your um, New York State DC project manager to identify like sampling events or samples that are associated with the RI, FS, uh, uh, things like that, you can work with them on that. So that's the sample section. So if I get back to test results, I still have 11,000, oh no, excuse me, 131 rows with errors. Um, and we can take a look here, see if we can fix, fix these quickly. Um, I have a lab code. Let's just go across and look at the field again real quick. The sample code is coming from the sample section. The lab analytical method name, this 160.1 is not a valid value in the, uh, in the uh, New York State DC reference values. Um, we can look through here what might be. There are quite a few that begin with E, and there's one probably that's E160.1. Uh, I can see that there. So here I can just highlight the column and say control find, and go grab 160.1 and change it to E160.1 and save replace all. One thing to note is when you're working with many of these analytical EDDs and you find that you're fixing things over and over again, uh, there is an, a remap section. I don't believe that's available in EDP standalone remap, is it? Okay, sorry about that. If you're a pro user, you could use that. But just go with the find replace. It's, it's good. As you can see, I had 100 and uh, some odd errors there. Now I have um, just a few. D2937, um, that is not the error in this case. The error is somewhere over here. It's with the lab name. Um, what I plan to do to resolve this error is, again, if the, if the lab name code is not in RT company, which you can check over here in the reference values, RT company, you can click on a header and sort anything by clicking on the header. In this case, we'll go and find C, R, E values, and I don't see ECCS in there. So what I plan to do in this case to move through the session is just to change that to alpha like these others. And here I'm going to find ECCS and change it to alpha. And I still have a few more errors. Let's just take a look at what those are. I have a lab analytical method name uh, called BART, um, which is not in the reference value. So what I think I'm going to do in this case is I'm not going to load any BART data at the time. I'm going to uh, save this data in my, in my original EDD uh, for a later submission, once I get, uh, once I submit a request to the New York State DEC to add the BART analytical method to the uh, reference value, so I'm going to delete these rows. And as I mentioned, um, they are updating the process to request new valid values is to send an email um, to the New York ENV data at GWDC State New York US. We'll send, show you that in a second but include your name and company contact information, the name of the valid value reference list, the need that, that the value is, uh, the new value that is needed in the list, and any other information that is helpful, such as a description of the analytical method or, or CAS number. And please include valid value request in the subject line of your email and send that to New York State DEC and they will get that added for you uh, after they do their own due diligence research to make sure it's, it's a, a valid value that they want to have added. And they will work with you to get that taken care of. So now when you have everything green, we can go ahead and do a sign and submit, which basically is going to create an EDD package. Actually, before I, before I do this, I'd like to just point out you can save the current EDD. So I'm going to take my EDD. I'm actually going to change the file name so I can do this again and change it to version 5 and hit save. It's always good to make sure you have the .xlsx 
extension and also choose the .xls file type. Uh, it just helps Microsoft think correctly and then when you save it out, it might take a little bit of a long time, it counts in seconds, but basically creating and saving that workbook out for you. So all those changes we just made in the EDP program are now saved. So if I want to do this again, I can use this EDD without having to resolve all those errors. So I think I talked about how to open formats, open EDDs. I did not hit on this error summary and error log. These are great buttons. You can click an error summary and save that to your hard drive. It opens up in an HTML format. In this case, I have fixed all the errors, so I don't have them listed here. And I'll do this a little earlier next time. But what it'll do is it'll list out a summary of your errors for you and it's something you can share with people uh, about those errors. The error log will actually produce a detailed list of all your errors and exactly which line on the Excel workbook the uh, error is, is found. So I think we've talked about turning on and off our errors and filtering. You can pin columns. So if you're way over here and you want the you know, uh, prep method to be the first column, you set pin and that brings it over. Uh, you can also turn columns on or off. I've also found this column chooser to be a great way to be able to select a column. By doing that, closing, it kind of highlights a column for you. Um, that's more related to Pro. If you wanted to add a value, if I wanted to come up here and add a data provider, I can click Add New Row, and right here I can now add Alpha as a lab and uh, you know some other information. Now here I have an error, so if I save out my error log, you know I'm going to get a new error log, and here's my error uh, report. So that's a good little feature that is in here. Um, so. Um, with that, we'd like to um, get back to this little slideshow and um, basically uh, just bring up this page here and, and just refer people to um, these websites here. Again, the New York State DC um, homepage, the, um, the, um, also the screen for the, um, the quick start guide as well as the EDP format of the first on site on this beautiful website that the state has. Um, mm -hmm. And you can get to the, you know, the um, Earthsoft Community Center right there on the website. You can get other information uh, about how to load documents, as well as the Quick Start Guide and the, um, the place to email to add your valid value. There's information right here about how to add valid values to the reference value tables. And I have a question. Um, first time that we go through uh, and set up the files, say if I have a site with 100 sample locations and um, for a sample event uh, we only sample 10 of them, uh, will I get an error message if I include the locations that were not sampled with the, with the deliverable? I can answer that. Um, no, you you can provide, if you would like, there's a couple ways you could do it, but you could provide all 100 locations and submit that with the location table the first time. And then your uh, sample and test results could include information for only 10 of those. Um, and say another round, you have an additional 20 or whatever, um, you don't need to supply that location table ever again unless you obviously have modifications to it. So um, we do know that some people prefer to give all their locations up front. Um, with sample and test results separate, um, or you can, um, or you can just supply the locations at the time you're supplying uh, sample and test results information. Does that do it? I do. Um, the data provider has to be filled out with every submission. What about just adding data to an existing site where data has already been submitted? Yeah. The uh, once the company, once the data provider or lab or subcontractor who, or whoever has been added to our valid value table, the RT company table, it does not need to be supplied ever again. So then you would just continue to use that code, but you don't, you don't ever supply it again. As a matter of fact, we would prefer that you don't because it can jam us up a little bit. So. With the answer to that last question about submitting lots of locations but only submitting partial data, I tried to do that and I did get an error. Because yeah, when I when I tried to do it, I was given a you know like 40 locations, and we only had samples on like eight of them, 
And it wouldn't let me submit the other locations because there was no data associated with it, is what it said, because I wasn't submitting stuff with it. So I, well, I couldn't could do be that. A case, it could be a case where, like, you want to, like, submit those locations without any samples and don't even include the sample tables within the EDD format. Get your locations data provider and, you know, submit it in, into there. And then when you, vice versa, when you're filling out your samples, just populate your sample table with the eight samples and the test results associated with that but leave out the location tab when you're in EDP to create the EDD. Okay. Okay, that makes sense. But, I mean, I was just saying I couldn't do it both at once. I understand that you could do them separately and it would probably work, but it wouldn't let me do it all at once. Right. Yeah, we can check that, but, yeah. Well, you know, we're trying to submit data for a lot of sites, and the bulk of our sites right now don't have spatial information associated with them. We don't have surveyed wells, so we don't have, you know, we have relative elevation on some of them, but we don't have, you know, X, Y coordinates on them. So, I mean, obviously those are required fields. Is there like a dedicated placeholder we can use for that? I, I know I've used that because I'm a regular Equus user as well. Um, I mean, I've used that in, in other Equus things where, you know, you don't have something that works, so you throw in like a zero or something so that you... You just because they have to have something, but I don't have right. coordinates for them. Right. So the the locations for normal environmental samples are required. Um, you you could use zeros to supply them. I would I would not prefer that. Um, in the absence of survey data, you can use other GIS resources like Google or um, you know you know whatever you know some AutoCAD resources or or just pulling it off a topographic map, and you can indicate that that that's the the level of effort that was used. Um, and then in the future when you do, if you do choose to do a round of surveying, then you can upgrade those locations um, to include that information. Um, so my, my recommendation along those lines would be to use other GIS and mapping resources to estimate those locations. And but I mean, how, and you know, how, I, how, I was gonna say, how accurate though can you actually get by like using a Google map? Because like we have some of them where we don't have it in CAD or you know, these are projects that we've been doing for 15 years, so the original data is is old, and while we're getting the new data in the Equus format, you know, we just don't have that that technology to, okay, well, to back you know, it up the, and just you, try to get you, that accurate with it. You can certainly talk to the PM and see what they're looking for, but certainly I would say I've seen a, a pretty good amount of accuracy because it's certainly more accurate than zero. If you put in zero, then you can't use any spatial information. Um, right. If you can estimate it from a top a topographic map or whatever other maps are available, um, I'm, you know that may be suitable for that project. So that's where you want to interface with your project manager. Okay, um, we'll give that a shot. I mean, I know that you know we've been trying to get from our PMs, you know, what they want. And they don't even seem to be sure what the heck they want. Well, like yes, a we're all learning here, and there's a different different um, understanding about what this can do for project managers and. Uh, we have varying levels of um, of uh, understanding at this point. Um, okay. So certainly, I, I can facilitate discussions with project managers. Someone added to your question about you know future submittals. Once you do obtain those data, you can then resubmit, and it is um, preferred that you indicate in the email that you are resubmitting location data. Um, you're, you're letting people know is. Be as verbal as you can in the description in the email as possible. Don't just say, see attached and things like that. Yeah, okay. It. And one thing, I guess, uh, when, when a company is added to the, um, a contractor is added to RT company, when they go and download the format files and then they register, so one right. person uh, per company is actually on the RT company list, and that is be basically being used as, a, as kind of like an email distribution list to notify folks of updates format. So if, um, if somebody is listed as a company contact, they get the email, um, we're asking that they be responsible to distribute that information throughout their organization so that everybody knows that there are updates and they need to look at them. Um, on the is there actually going to be emails that go out? Because I know there was at least one format update that I didn't know about and then I happened to go back to the website and there was a, a whole update to the format. Yeah, I'm, I'm the contact on the, on the community room. Um, and we're getting other other communication devices in place, um, but we'll we'll announce it on our website and we'll put it on the community room. Um, oh, basically. Else, oh, the other thing that I was going to say back on the on the um, the RT company table, 
various companies are listed with different offices. Some companies are, you know, we kind of leave it up to the company. If they want to be listed once as their company name, and that counts for all their offices, or whether or not you want a, a code for each of your offices so that either you or, you know, consultants in the DC can distinguish where it came from exactly. It kind of depends on the way the company manages their data submissions. Um, but we definitely don't want um, data providers down to the actual company project manager level. It's basically one company entry per office per consulting firm. Right. So just one more quick clarification, though. So basically, it's, it's basically like the contact person's prerogative to keep checking for updates then. We won't, we won't actually get an email notification. We have to, because I mean, I'm subscribed to the community center too, I think, for Earthsoft, so that when there, something goes out, sometimes I get notifications for that and sometimes I don't. Yeah, we'll be, we'll be bolstering our, our communications on this. Okay. But look for a format change today or tomorrow. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Um, and this, this email list in, in the RT company is only those emails that were submitted when people filled out the registration form. So um, we may not have everybody you know, in, in RT company right now. Um, but that's just something to be cognizant of. Cognizant of. Uh, so hopefully the, you know, the emails get you. If you find any, you're not getting an email, uh, I think maybe the contact you would want to uh, send an email to is the New York uh, email address on the website just to let them know you'd like to be added to their distribution list. They can, they can actually, that's basically what they'll do is they'll update the reference table to uh, put that information on the slide. So, um, I'm not sure if we've covered this one about the SDG name. Do you pull? Um, so sample delivery groups right now get loaded at the sample, uh, the sample section. And so is that on, stored on the test table or is it stored in the sample section? I believe it's stored in the sample table. So they're, they're currently tracking sample delivery groups right now by each sample. Um, and, you know, so that would need to be like the prime laboratory um, sample delivery group number if, they, if they're subcontracting samples out to other laboratories at this point. Um, there is going to be a manual release. I think the timeline is soon. Very soon. Yeah, we we'll get the uh, format out. We're making some very minor final changes to the format. Then our guidance will be put in line with that, and we hope to have the guidance out in days. And that's a much more comprehensive EDD manual um, compared to the quick start guide that's out there. And James, if you're on the line and you want to elaborate on this question you have here regarding a formal notification to be sent to the company project managers for data submittal, I believe. Well, what I would like to know is, is there a formal, is there a list of facilities already created in your reference values? And if so, has there been a notification sent out to those project managers? And if not, will there be of when the data needs to be submitted? Is there a deadline date to be submitting data, or should we just start submitting? So I think that you know that some general guidance had gone out, James, um, to project managers or facility contacts um, originated from Dale. Um, and then also, I, I know from CDM's perspective, we've seen our PMs have been notified by New York State DEC PMs to follow the process with, a, I think, a PDF attachment to that, talking about the April 1st deadline and that sort of thing. I don't know that there are any other further communications going out, so you may want to check with your New York State DEC project manager. Okay. Thank you. In some cases, we're, we seem to be sort of unsure about what data needs to be submitted through the DEC. Like some of our project managers aren't giving us any guidance whatsoever on whether we should or should not be submitting this data. They're not requiring it at all. Is all data supposed to be submitted or is that on a case-by-case -case basis? Well, but basically it's all data that's being generated after, is it after April 1st? Um, where the, the gray area comes in with historic data, and I'm, I'm offered to work with the project managers to help them decide what and how to get historic data in. But if you are generating data under one of our remedial programs, um, including spills, spills are a special case, but in some of the larger spills, again, this is where you want to work with the project manager, 
and, and REC for corrective actions um, are also included in that. If you're generating data under any of those major remedial programs for the Division of Environmental Remediation, um, data should be submitted in, in the EDD format. And all the PMs know that. If they know that. <laughs> have they, um, yes. They, uh, maybe we have one under a rock. I don't know. But um, they've heard this many times. Uh, we have various levels of acceptance. We have various levels of training. Um, your project manager, the website and your project manager should be your sort of first check and your first course of, um, of uh, you know, trying to find information. But uh, I'm, I'm willing to facilitate discussions along those lines. Um, you know, we can include the, super, uh, the, the project manager and their supervisor to decide what data needs to be included. Again, the gray area is in some of the historic data. The time forward stuff, really anything that's being generated now should come in in the EDD format. So we, we, we do want to let people know that um, there is going to be future training webinars outside of this um, office hours through Earthsoft. This, this office hours will be posted on their YouTube channel, but for, so you can go back and review it. Um, but there will be a future trainings announced through New York State DEC sometime this summer. Uh, so you can look for those but may actually be a little bit longer than the time we actually have for this webinar today. Um, I have a question about the location information as well. Okay. Um, after you list the coordinates and everything, there are several columns listed as, um, I'm assuming horizontal collect method code, accuracy value, accuracy unit, and datum code? Yes. What values should be in those fields? The, um, the, there are values that are we're following that are close to the EPA Region 2 values. Okay. And, and there's a guidance document that's going to come out that's going to be very similar to the comprehensive manual issued by EPA Region 2. And in Appendix A, it's going to list all of the fields that are in there. Okay. But right now, I think if you, um, if you open the format and actually go, in, go into that, that section, you can, you can go to one of those fields and see some of the values that are in there. So they, they are populated with um, some of the values currently in, in the database. Okay. But these are, in, these are enumerated values, so they're not necessarily loaded in the, um, in the reference oh. tables that you see over here. Yeah, the new format will also be clear with that. The, the, some of the guidance has, has been um, added to the format itself. So when you see, uh, uh, hopefully tomorrow when we get the new format out there, you download the new format, you, you'll see even more information built in. Okay. as to some of those values in the description, but also in the enumeration list. Okay. I have a question. Um, does the state require drill activity, lithology, well, well construction? Is that all required? Yeah, that, that's really um, a time forward thing. It, it, it should be coordinated with your project manager. Um, you know, we, right now, because this is new, you know, we're trying to catch up with historic data, and uh, when you're looking at uh, sites that have had a fair amount of information gathered already, you should be working with your project manager to see which of that historic information you want to gather. But for new sites and new projects um, and new phases of projects, these uh, tables should be required. Uh, should be submitted. Again, that's something you can confirm with your pro your DEC project manager. This is also very new to DEC project managers, and not all of them are are ha have the same level of training. And you know, since we haven't used it for a long time, um, they're also not sure what the system can do for them. So they're not always up to speed on what they need. So uh, as the Equus administrator, I'm available to uh, facilitate discussions between consultants and project managers and their supervisors if necessary. So tomorrow, when the new the new version version becomes available, do we download that and replace the version that we currently have on our computers? Yeah, that's correct. I mean, if you um, within the format when you when you download it, you'll download a zip file that. Um, let's see if I have it here. Um, when you download it, you'll download a zip file that then will extract these files right over the same ones you had before. If you wanted to, you could take your existing files and copy them in a folder to save it as an archive, like an older version or something. But um, really, you just need the most recent files. 
Okay, so it'll just replace them. Okay. It'll just replace them, right? Yeah. If you go to the EarthSoft site, uh, you know, on the yep here on the EarthSoft or in, from the New York State DEC site, you can get to the format files here, which brings you to the um, EarthSoft New York State DEC web page, and you can click on the the EDP to download EDP. You can click to download the format file as well. Last time it was updated was May 6, but there's going to be an update. And you know you can you potentially see regular updates of these files when reference values are being updated. You're going to want to download probably the last four files there. If you've already got the EDP, um, then you're just going to want to grab a copy of the last four uh, links there: the the version, the blank EDD, the format file, and the valid values. For your reference, you can also generate those through the through the EDP. Depends on how you want to do that, but they'll all be updated. So the formats are all stored on the EarthSoft website. They are linked from our website. There is not another version on our website, so they're all in one spot. You can just, you know, you could you could check our the DEC website often, and we'll try to put as much information and announcements and things like that there, and then the new. And then you'll always uh, obtain the format files from the EarthSoft website. Uh, one more clarifying question: um, Our groundwater data, and then we get all the well information, latitude, longitude, all that stuff in there. That would all go into the field section. We'd be able to submit that, and then as we generate each batch of groundwater data, it sounded like you explained you don't have to um, get the well information. You would just um, blank out that section of the field information, and you would just have the lab data, which would be tied back to the location code. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. If you're, so if you're submitting just water level data, you could just fill out this section, and it's going to go to the CISLO code, which has already been loaded previously through location, which and also your well information is already in the system. If you're adding one or two new wells, you could add those wells um, along with that water level EDD. We have uh, an ECHOS database that has the data that came from the lab, and maybe it has water level location information. Anyway, um, you say fill out this EDD. Can't we export from our ECHOS database? Yes. If you right now, the New York State DEC has a has a format, and if you license that format through EarthSoft, they will provide you with an export that will allow you to. Export the license. Uh, excuse me. Export your data directly to it. Um, I know CDM has grabbed it because we have so many sites that we that we deal with. And it basically, it, it, it's when, when you're in Pro and you you know you and you have an EDP of a home and a Pro tab. The exports on the Pro tab. Essentially, it opens up the format when you click Pro and then you click Export. It just fills the EDD. And then you go and save save out an Excel workbook or you can actually save out a zip file. And what that will do is it'll actually take all the sections and create them as text files within that zip file. And that's nice because sometimes Excel can be a little quirky with um, CAS numbers and dates and things. It's sometimes better to deal directly with text files. So that zip file then is ready to load? Has it? Does it have our certificate with it, you know, sign and submit? Well, when, when you're in Pro, you're actually creating an EDD. Um, and an EDD, an EDD is a... Um, you can open EDDs as zip files. You can open XML, text, CSV, et cetera. So it's really just creating a zip file with, with, a, um, with the sections in it. When you do sign and submit, the difference there is it's also naming the zip file for you according to the naming convention that New York State's looking for. It's, it's putting a stamp on the, on the package with the um, facility code and the program code and also adding your user certificate um, to authenticate it. Yeah, so you really, yeah, you would want to you would want to do sign and submit so when you export into Pro, then do sign and submit so you're not just saving out the EDD, you're creating a package. So, you're right. Chris, did you have pricing on that EDD format? Uh, this is Emily from EarthSoft. The, so it's a, it's a package, um, it's an import-export schema package because with the DEC format, there comes some additional um, schema updates that you have to make to your database as well. And I email uh, sales at earthsoft.com for more information or, or just support at earthsoft.com. We're happy to, to help you out with that. So, 
Thank you, Elaine, for allowing me to help you do it. Well, thank, and thank you, Bob, and uh, thank you to everybody who's joined today. It's 